Welcome to uh, Weather Planning with ForeFlight. My name is Alex McMillan. I'm a pilot support team lead, uh, also a CFII, commercial multi-engine. Um, so I deal a lot with, with teaching this type of stuff, talking to other pilots, you know, such as yourselves. Uh, really passionate about weather. Who, who flew in today? All right. Where's the, where's the furthest place you flew in from? Anybody got a really far expedition? Where in California? California. All right. I still don't know what. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. That's pretty good. Um, how? Uh, I'm gonna kind of get a get a real quick kind of a uh, kind of a temperature of uh, everybody here. Uh, how many folks um, have uh, have their instrument rating here? Oh, wow. Nice. Very nice. Any uh, any instructors? Chance. All right. Well. It's going to be more difficult than I thought. All right, uh, any examiners by chance? <laughs> Not today, FAA. All right, awesome. Uh, cool. Today I'm going to be talking about you know weather and planning, like I just said. But but realistically, what I'm going to be what I'm going to be kind of doing is I'm going to be talking more from a, from an instructor standpoint. Uh, of course, I'm going to be including four flight because they pay my bills. But at the same time. I really want to really want to kind of talk about, you know, how we look at weather, how we determine, you know, what what's a go no go decision, you know, if we see this, what does it mean to our flight, and what what does it what does it mean for, you know, our turbulence, or what does it mean for our, um, you know, is this going to be convective energy, or is this going to be more, you know, just rainy drizzly stuff? So, you know, I really want to it's I really wanted to make make it clear that, you know, I'm not just going to be standing up here kind of just going through slides, but I really want to make it more of a, a kind of conversation. You know, I will be going through a part where we're going to be touching on all of these things individually, but at the end, I really do want to, would love to hear some questions uh, whenever we get to the Q&A portion so that we can kind of suss some of these things out. Is anybody here just like a complete weather expert and needs no additional information? Yeah, I don't think they exist. I don't think meteorologists even have all the information. Um, so I'm the same way. I think we're, we're all students. We're always still learning. Even if we're instructors, ATP, flying with the big boys, we're all constantly still learning. So it, I, I love having a more constructive, you know, uh, conversational type of, of uh, conversation or topic whenever we're, we're talking about this. So, so let's get started. Uh, today I'm, I'm going to kind of talk about just some of the realities that we all face as pilots. You know, we, we, we think about all of the, the great things about being pilots, going and having that freedom and flying through the air, because it's awesome, and that's all we want to think about. Uh, but in the reality, we also have things that we really need to make sure that we, that we keep in mind at all time, and that's that we are, we're tempting fate, always. And the, the more and more that we have the ability to mitigate those risks, the, the better our chance for survival and the better our chance for having a good experience. So we're also going to dive into the maps layers on four flight, look at the imagery layers, look at our briefing. We're gonna to touch on the Sentry and uh, ADSB and a little bit of in-flight weather. And then we're gonna wrap up and talk about, uh, you know, get some questions from y'all. So let's get started. So nobody likes talking about this type of stuff, but um, on February 3rd, 2019, uh, pilot departs in his Cessna 414 under VFR rules from Fullerton Municipal Airport. Because of a few errors in judgment, a lack of understanding of the weather in the surrounding area, the uh, pilot unfortunately lost his life that day. So let's talk about, let's, let's break down what happened. Why, why, how did it get to this point, right? First of all, we all need to remember, FARs are, is everybody's favorite subject, right? You know, we all, we all love just digging into those and, and just reading them. They're, they're very colorful and lively. But they are very important. So one of the one of the big ones is 91103. It's the first thing I teach any of my students when we're talking about cross country planning, and especially um, ensuring that they understand how important this important this information is. Um, now, of course, I could sit here and read the whole reg to you, but that would take too long, and and frankly, it would almost be just as confusing as we started. So, of course, as anybody who's gotten any kind of instruction knows. We love abbreviations. So, 
NW Craft, it's the one I've always used. Uh, it stands for NOTAMs, weather, known ATC delays, runway links, alternate airports, fuel, and takeoff and landing data. Uh, the only thing that ForeFlight will not provide is gonna be the known ATC delays. For those, you will have to go to the FAA website. You can honestly find it by doing a Google search for known ATC delays and, and clicking on anything that says FAA.gov on it, essentially, and that's gonna give you that information. But everything else can be, can be accessed through ForeFlight, which is really, really awesome. Um, so this is the situation the pilot in question got in. So this pilot had just over 10,000 hours, and that's, that's insane to me. Um, that, uh, you know, uh, it, uh, he was instrument rated and he was operating a, an IFR capable rated aircraft. Uh, he also had a Stratus 2S on board with AHARS and WASH GPS capabilities. So when he contacted Tower that day, which was uh, primarily IMC conditions in the, in the surrounding area, uh, he requested a left downwind departure to the east. Tower approved this departure but warned the pilot to be wary of the weather starting four nautical miles east of Fullerton. And be wary, meaning, hey, it's IMC, don't fly in it. Uh, the meteorological conditions at this point were IMC, as well as convective with heavy thunderstorm and microburst potential. So we're going to kind of dive into that. So something that, that, of course, does happen, and it happens to all of us, we all have a level of ego. I mean, you have to have a level of ego as a pilot if you think, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm going to fly in the sky like a bird as a human. There, there's something a little bit egotistical about that that we're, we're actually harnessing Mother Nature and using it against her, right? So sometimes we need to make sure we check ourselves. That's why we talk about the five hazardous attitudes, macho, anti-authority, thank you, impulsivity. Um, you know, as we, as we talk about these, these attitudes, we honestly, we can look in, and in ourselves, and, and if we're being honest, we can probably find each one of them dashed a little bit as we're going through, right? So something we need to always remember is, is, is to keep those things in check. You know, always ask myself, always ask yourself, is this smart? Is this something that, is this necessary? Is this something that if I don't do it, it's, it's going to ruin the rest of my life? You know, ultimately it can be the, the change in, in uh, it can be that change in, in uh, decision-making that ultimately saves you and multiple other people's lives. So as we're going and talking uh, about this, I want to kind of point out something here. Take a look um, up on the screen. When, when we're looking at the map here, uh, we can see that the... Oh. Oh, there it is. Oh, wow. Okay. It works. All uh, right, we can see that the uh, left side of the screen is going to be, um, well, first of all, up here where it says air on hazard, this is gonna be our uh, layer selector. So at the top of the screen, we can see aeronautical street map, you know, aerial maps, different US VFR sectionals and IFR in route charts. These are gonna be primarily overlays on the left side of your screen. These are gonna be charts, maps, not as interactive besides the aeronautical layer, which is super interactive and awesome, and I highly suggest everybody use it. Um, but it's, it's gonna be primarily more for laying over and, and giving you more detailed information about the chart that's in front of you. Now, for the right side of the screen, or sorry, of that menu, these are gonna be your layers. These are gonna be the actual, there we go. All right, sorry, it's a little difficult looking backwards. This is going to be the actual uh, different layers that are, that are going to be uh, our tools to be able to look at weather, to be able to look at the different conditions, to be able to, to take it all in and, and make sure that we understand what it is exactly that we're looking at with the flight that, for that day. All right, so first let's talk about radar. This is our radar. It's one of, the, one of, one of, one of my favorite parts of the app. Um, it, it's really realistically just a real-time view of the precipitation that happens around you. Now, something that I do understand a lot of people have uh, misconceptions about is that radar, if you don't see a radar um, display over your area, but you're seeing clouds, you're thinking that might be wrong. Well, radar is really going to be more picking up those uh, harder particulates, those, those more dense particulates that are in the air. 
it's not necessarily going to find the clouds and, and all of those different things. We're, we're looking at precip, we're looking at uh, convective activity, potentially, we're looking at hail, you know, all of these different things that, that are actually uh, being built within these, uh, these cloud systems is going to be more what it picks up. So if you do go outside, you look up and you're like, I see clouds everywhere and there's not a radar spot above me. That's something to keep in mind. Now, something I wanted to kind of point out on this is let's take a look. Let's take a look up here. So we see a few things, right? We see some numbers. Uh, we see a, a couple different symbols. We see a bunch of arrows. What this is kind of telling us is if we look at uh, the, the orange kind of cyclical symbol up there, what that's basically saying is that there's a uh, rotation starting to happen. And anytime we have rotation, we kind of know what that means. That's convective. Convective is typically going to be, especially for us GA pilots, that's going to be something we definitely want to avoid, right? Well, the numbers there are going to all be talking about the top of the storm, right? So 250, we're going to be looking at flight level 250. That's where it tops out. And the arrows are going to be pointing in the direction of the storm and, and where it's going to be headed. So I just want to get that out of the way and kind of talk about what we're actually looking at when we, when we look here. Now, if we kind of keep moving on, we kind of take a, take a little different look here at the radar layer. We can see uh, we have uh, different, different, uh, different intensities between the different uh, parts of that, of that layer. So you can see in the yellow, red, darker green, green version, these, these are all going to be the, basically the, uh, the, uh, the intensities of the, the, of the return of that radar symbol. Now, just because there is an intense area in a certain position, does that necessarily mean there's convective activity there? No, absolutely not. That's why just taking a look at the radar and just and saying, you know what, I think we're good to go, is not really necessarily the thing that we need to do, especially if we are uh, planning on flying that day. Uh, we need to have a grasp of the whole picture. So different things like understanding Okay, are we in a low pressure or a high pressure area? Are we in a trough? Are we going to be in a cold front or are we in a warm front? All of these different things are going to change the, the type of weather that's going to be, the type of precipitation, and honestly, the type of uh, stability that's going to be in that air at, at, at that uh, exact spot. I'm going to move on from radar for now. If anybody has any questions, we can talk about it in the Q&A. I'm gonna go ahead and go to our clouds layer. This layer is super cool, I love it. Uh, it's, it's just an immediate look at the forecast of what our clouds are gonna be looking at. We can see at the bottom there is uh, a legend where based on the uh, uh, depth of that cloud, you can see whether it's few, scattered, broken, or overcast, of course. Um, and then at the very bottom, we can see that we have a uh, time slider. So this is just going to show the movement of the clouds based on the forecast that we have coming up. Once again, uh, it's important to note that this is a forecast um, and not an observation layer here. Um, for anybody, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to everybody here, uh, the difference between an observation and a forecast, while it may seem obvious, is that the forecast is going to be looking ahead into the future, building on different data models and, and processing what's going to be happening, whereas an observation is either a machine or a person looking out and saying, hey, there's a cloud. So I just want to point that out. This is a forecast model. So keep that in mind. Anytime you have a forecast, this is, this is more theorized than it is you know, actual. So moving right along, we also have the icing layer. As instrument rated pilots, the, the group that I was talking to before, we know that uh, the icing layer is one of the most important key parts of us when we're planning our flight. Not the icing layer, but icing in general. Um, does anybody know off the top of their head when we can just when we can get icing for an aircraft? And I don't necessarily mean pitot tube being clogged up, but like when do we when do we start to get icing? There's two things: visible moisture. And temperature, right? Uh, freezing temperature. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I remember from my instrument check ride, I had this great DPE. She was from South Africa, and she had the mouth of a sailor. I used to be a sailor. I can verify and 
It was, it was, it was awesome. Well, she had me read out a METAR. And when I was looking through that METAR, she was saying, what is it about this METAR that should scare you as an instrument ready pilot? And so I'm looking, and of course she gives me a METAR that's about three pages long. And I have to sit there with a decoder and, and decrypt everything. And as I'm going through, I realize, okay, I've got 35 gusting 40. That's not good. That's not good in my 172 with my 45 hours of flying. Well, I guess I had about 100 hours of flying. Um, I'm looking, oh, there's rain, there's drizzle, uh, there's, there's clouds, but that shouldn't matter to me because I'm an instrument rated pilot. You know, I can fly through the clouds. So uh, there's a temperature of about four degrees and a dew point about negative one. Okay, I uh, never looked at that before. I don't care what that means. Um, we'll just move right along from that and not even bat an eye. And we've got some remarks, some stuff is broken, you know, notums. Uh, can't remember what they were at the time, but at the time I was also very bad at looking at my notums. I'll be honest. Um, looking down, I said, oh, it's gotta be the weather. 35 gusting 40, there's no way I can fly in that. You know, it's, it's right down the chute, but I, that, that freaks me out. If I see anything over 10 knots, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not flying. And uh, she said, okay, anything else? I was like, well, it's rainy. I don't want my plane to get wet, you know. So we keep moving on, she finally goes, what about the temperature dew point spread? And I was like, yeah, what about it? <laughs> Ultimately, yeah, that was her point. That temperature dew point spread, how many degrees are we losing for every thousand feet? Two degrees, right? And that's, uh, now that's by ISA, of course there could be a thermal inversion, but by ISA standards, we're losing two degrees every thousand feet. So if I get up to 2,500 feet, my temperature and dew point have met at negative one degrees. And I am getting iced over in a Cessna 172. That's not good. <laughs> we do not have Fiki in that plane, as uh, I'm sure everybody knows here. So icing, especially for an instrument pilot, I, I, I can't stress enough. This is something that, that I beat into my students' heads. If there's a possibility of icing, and you do not have uh, de-icing equipment, it is not worth it. And if you do have de-icing equipment, ask yourself if it's worth it, right? All right, something else that's really cool that we've got. Uh, we've got just a, a graphical display of any of your airmets and SIGMETs. What we've done is we've just taken it, taken the information directly from uh, NOAA, and we, we, we just put it in, a, in an area where you can actually view it and actually have an understanding without having to plot all of the uh, longitude, latitude points, and then draw up uh, an area. So anything you see in red is gonna be a SIGMET or convective SIGMET. Anything in yellow on the screen is gonna be a, a convective outlook. Uh, so it's not come to pass yet, but it's potential. That's kind of basically what this is saying. And uh, any of your orange is gonna be uh, turbulence, uh, your, your AirMet tangos. Uh, something, to, something to kind of take keep in mind is you can uh, also turn on or turn off what you actually want to see. So if you're not interested in icing layers, you're not interested in uh, you know, turbulence or any of that, you can just look for, am I going to run into a thunderstorm or am I going to run into IFR? So super, super useful feature. And uh, some I also want to mention, uh, any of these layers, especially this layer right here, if you just tap on the area, you will get a readout of what exactly is going on. So if you're looking, you can't quite remember what it is, just tap on it and it'll read out something like, hey, this is a, you know, we've got some significant weather coming this way. So very useful tool, very helpful. Everybody's favorite, surface analysis. It's my favorite. I actually do love this, this chart. I love this chart because to me, this is the essence of what weather is. Um, this surface analysis uh, uh, layer, we, we basically take the information just to, once again directly from the NOAA, and we, we post it on here. But I wanna just kinda talk about the implications and what some of these things mean uh, for a moment. So, let's start up in Vancouver and Seattle in the good old Pac Northwest where it's never raining. So we'll look at, uh, we'll, we'll kinda start from the top and work our way down, right? So first up here we see this purple uh, area. What this is signifying is an occluded front, right? So what you get with an occluded front is you have a warm air and a cold air kind of battling out to see who, who wins, right? They're, they're moving along, 
with each other in a specific direction. As you can see, they're, they're surrounded by, or surrounding a kind of low pressure area, which is why you see that, uh, that cyclic mo motion to the uh, counterclockwise rotation. And um, yeah, it's not good. Basically, anytime you see an occluded front, you can pretty much assume you're gonna have pretty violent thunderstorms in that area. So definitely something, even if it looks like a nice day, um, that air is not gonna be stable at all. And you're potentially gonna be kind of, kind of gambling there a little bit when it comes to your safety. Moving down, we see a cold front. We all know what cold fronts mean, right? It means I can go outside again, finally, in Texas. But what it actually means is that we have storms coming in, potentially. We will lose a little bit of air. That cold air is moving along the ground and it's pushing and forcing that warm air upwards, causing that lift. Once you get that lift, you start getting convective activity. And, and with that convective activity, you're building these uh, big towering cumulus clouds. These clouds within the clouds are, are having you know, uh, the, the uh, uh, moisture rotating and, and building and building and, and becoming more and more dense, eventually turning into either a thunderstorm, well, uh, a thunderstorm, almost, like, almost, almost always. Um, so a couple things about a thunderstorm. We have three phases, uh, the cumulus, mature, and the dissipating. Uh, cumulus, you know, it's building and, and it's creating. We might have some rain, we might have a little bit of lightning building. Uh, mature is gonna be the most violent, of course. This is where we have everything kind of going on. And just after that, the dissipating, still pretty violent. Uh, in any one of these uh, phases, we can have downdrafts or microbursts. Does anybody know the speed of a microburst? Yeah, it's about, it's about uh, uh, 100 miles per hour downwards, so about 10,000 feet per minute, I believe. I should have fact-checked that before I got up here and asked everybody to say it. Uh, but it's about 100 miles per hour coming, shooting straight downwards. Now, do we know exactly where, where's the most dangerous place for you to be near a microburst? It's not necessarily directly under it, right? So what happens is in a microburst is the air comes down, shoots down at a very violent rate. When it hits, pushes out in, in every direction. Eventually, and I saw you start doing the vortex, eventually that air starts to vortex out. So when you're coming into that, that uh, air, that violent air, you start getting actually really good performance. You're getting a bunch of headwind. Aircraft starts picking up a little bit. You go, all right, we're doing good. And then as you get on the other side, you, you will just lose all of that power, right? You get through the middle and you get to the other side, you lose all of that, you stall out. It's never a good day, especially for us. Um, microbursts are so violent that back in, what was it, 1988? Uh, they brought down a Delta aircraft outside Dallas, a huge airliner. So this is one of the reasons why in a thunderstorm, we try to stay at least 20 nautical miles away from any time. It, from any thunderstorm at any given time. That's not just good habit or good procedure. That's actually from the FAA's mouth. 20 nautical miles in any direction from a thunderstorm will, will keep you safer than if you are any closer. A uh, big, big part of that is the microburst. All right, let's keep looking. So these little uh, dashed lines, this is gonna be your trough. Um, these are gonna be areas of relatively, you know, lower pres pressure moving right along. Um, in these areas, you're gonna see more kind of stratiform type of clouds, maybe a little bit more drizzly, uh, showery, uh, not necessarily super violent, um, but good to know where they are, right? Now we see all these different bars going, going along with these numbers. Um, these numbers, of course, indicate the pressure in these different areas. So you might see 1,016, 1,012, and, and might have previously wonder like, what does that mean? Uh, so those are the millibars in pressure that you're, that you're actually seeing on this chart. So has anybody ever gone hiking, a show of hands, and looked at like an elevation chart? You can kind of think of this like a pressure elevation chart. The closer those isobars are together, the, the more steep that cliff, so to speak, right? So as you're looking at the elevation chart, you know that if you have 1,000, then 1,100, and they're like, this close together, then you're not making it up that route, unless you, I don't know, grow really, really long legs. 
But um, here it's kind of the same way. The closer those are together, the more rapid that pressure is either ascending or descending, or getting greater or less, right? So what does that mean? What, let, let's, let's think about air. Let's think about like how air is. Uh, that's a weird thing to say, but let's think about it. You know, any kind of gas and, you know, like air has certain types of, of uh, fundamental, has certain types of fundamental um, characteristics about it, right? Well, I mean, we use the Bernoulli's principle to explain lift, right? You know, in the Bernoulli's principle, you could also use that to explain why, you know, uh, river rapids happen through specific parts of the river where it becomes narrower. Same thing with air. Uh, you can kind of think of air as a fluid. It's going to be moving in the, in the path of least resistance. So, if you have a higher pressure of air with a uh, much more drastically lower pressure of air directly next to it, that air is going to be moving towards that direction in a much, much quicker pace. Now, there's always more to weather, right? It's, I wish I could just look at this and be like, there's going to be wind right there. It's going to be going that way. It's going to be at 30 knots, right? Of course, there's always more to it. There's always something that, that you have to keep building on. But this is one of the factors. That pressure, uh, that rapid pressure decrease means that air is going to be trying to move towards that direction of the pressure decrease. And the greater the, uh, the, greater the, the decline there means the, the quicker that air is going to be moving. So a lot of times if you see these isobars really close together with a, with a big number spread, you're going to be looking at much higher, uh, much higher velocity of winds moving through there. All right. All right, let's move along. Uh, let's look at here. Oh, I hit the wrong button. There we go. Wait, here we go. All right, let's look at here. Um, what do we think that is? Anybody? Stationary front? Uh, same kind of thing here. Stationary front, you're going to be getting uh, kind of stratiform, showery weather. It's good to know what it is, though. Basically, you're having a cold front and a warm front meeting and just not moving, just staying right there. Now, let's talk about the differences between... You can all tell I'm an artist, right? Um, that's going to be my next career, is I'm going to draw. Uh, so let's talk about the differences between high pressure and low pressure areas really quick. So high pressure areas are, are uh, air is moving in, a, in this hemisphere anyways. It's moving in a clockwise fashion. It's moving outwards and it's moving downwards from, from that area, right? In this area, you're going to get more bad visibility, but you will get better weather. You're not going to be getting a lot of unstable air. You're going to be getting more of, of your kind of uh, uh, showery kind of weather, kind of stuff like we were talking about with the, uh, with the trough and, and all these other places. But in the low pressure systems, this is where you're going to get more kind of uh, unstable air. And that unstable air usually leads to another thing, which could be cumulative cumulonimbus clouds and eventually thunderstorms, right? So that's something to take and keep in mind when we're looking at this. I guess I could wait. I don't know why. I, I shouldn't let this bother me at this point. <laughs> I've been here all week. Uh, something to keep in mind at this point, this air is moving upwards, right? It hits that low pressure system and it, it just keeps spiraling up in a, in a counterclockwise rotation. So with that upwards moving air, you're going you're gonna to get that instability, you're going to get that, that, that movement, and then eventually you're going to get potential thunderstorms. So if you're ever looking at this slide and, and you ever have a, have a moment where you don't understand, or, or honestly, any, any one of these, uh, these layers, on the ForeFly app, go to More and then Documents, then scroll down. Uh, you can find the ForeFlight section under there, and in there we have a legends guide where it will show you something just like this, where we can go over and look at what, is, what do each of these things mean? Pressure labels, isobars, troughs, dry lines, stuff that you know, we don't normally see and, and might be confused about. Um, it, it doesn't only have the surface analysis information on here, by the way. It also has a lot of other great information, uh, ways to read these, these uh, different uh, weather products. So take a look at that whenever you uh, get done here. Just see, see if there's anything you've been missing out on. All right, I want to touch on 
One of those products that probably doesn't get used nearly as much as it probably should, and that's the Imagery tab. The Imagery tab is great. Imagery. There we go. The Imagery tab is great. Uh, it's, it's where I go when I need to make sure I have the information that, that I need for my flight, right? So when we're flying, what do we need to have? Do, can we just uh, turn on the Weather Channel and say, yep, I've got a briefing right now? We need to have the official information from a verified source. All this information, at least for us in the United States, is coming directly from the NOAA or the NCEP or the, the National Center for Environmental Protection, right? So if you were to go on aviationweather.gov, which I'm sure we're all intimately aware of what that website is, we um, are familiar with, we will see these same charts, right? What we do is we take those charts from there, basically upload it onto our, onto ForeFlight. We have a, just a very easy way to organize and just be able to see these charts at a moment's notice. So I highly recommend we use imagery. Really nice thing about imagery is the clouds page. One of the big things that we, that we as pilots are, are always wanting to know is where's the cloud tops? Where can I get over this? Right? Where, how can I get on top of these clouds and, and out, uh, over this cloud layer? This is going to be one of those places you can look. You can see here, I keep touching, the, there we go. Here at the bottom, uh, we've got a broken ceiling of 3,500 3, feet. Then we've got the tops at flight level 270, so 27,000 feet, right? So one of those, one, this, this is going to be one of those really nice things that we can actually take advantage of, but most people just don't because we have the flashy and the shiny uh, nice layers in, in front of us and, the, and they work great. But this, this is actually gonna be that raw information that comes directly from the NOAA, that forecasted information that we can use for our IFR cross countries. This is gonna be the type of stuff that we can use to decide, okay, do we wanna do, take a, make an alternate route over at this airport or should we come over here? So I think a, a big, a big theme and, uh, of, of my point and showing you and talking to you guys today is we need to, we need to expand our, our horizon. We need to expand how we use for flight if we're going to be as safe as we possibly can, you know, and that means tapping into some of these areas of the app that we're previously not as familiar with and maybe not feel as comfortable with using. If anybody does have any questions about any of these, by the way, uh, come see me at the booth. I'll be happy to, to go through them and talk through them. All right, so we're back to um, our pilot. Uh, this pilot continued eastward, causing him to fly further and further into IMC conditions on a VFR flight plan. Uh, eventually, the pilot loses situational awareness and tries to correct his altitude, uh, and then he ends up overcorrecting several times, showing a pitch deviation between 45 degrees down and 75 degrees up and a bank angle of 150 degrees left and 170 degrees right in a Cessna 414. Ultimately, he loses the left side of his horizontal stabilizer and ultimately, again, the left wing shears off, causing a wreckage of about 1,000 feet long. This resulted in the loss of the life of the pilot and four people on the ground and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of property damage. So. This is what happens, you know, this, uh, and, and this is the, the, the type of emotions that I got when I was preparing this and reading through this story. You know, it, it's, it's a tragedy that the pilot lost his life. But what the actual tragedy here is that four innocent people on the ground lost their lives when they had nothing to do with this one pilot's extremely bad decision making, poor decision making. He knew better, he was rated to fly it, he had the instruments to do it. He just didn't want to do it, right? And I'm, you know, I, don't, I have that tone in me right now because this all could have been avoided, you know? Just crashing into somebody's home while they're, while they're trying to enjoy their day. If he had just used the, the, used the tools that he had at his disposal, this could have all been avoided and, and this family could have, could have continued to have a normal life. All right, let's talk about another one. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know it's, it's not, not necessarily the happiest uh, uh, stuff to talk about. Uh, January 2nd, 2006, I think we've probably all seen this one. Uh, Devon Air departing from Billings, Montana in VFR conditions en route for Spanish Fork, Utah. 
Uh, he has received a briefing from his local flight service station, where flight service has advised at least three times that VFR is not recommended for his route of flight. Along his route of flight, as he's flying, ATC, kind of unspurred, keeps kind of telling him, hey, this is not a good idea. If you're flying VFR, you're flying into an IFR uh, or an IMC type of condition. And uh, he persists in choosing to fly into mountainous terrains with low ceilings, extremely low visibility, and freezing conditions. All right? So this is what I was talking about earlier. I got my, got my pilots mixed up a little bit about that icing layer, right? Let's talk about the briefing slide real quick. Does anybody not know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about briefing? Just put show of hands, anybody? All right, that's awesome. Briefing is awesome. I love using it. Um, I think there is a lot of value in actually calling the briefer and having that conversation with somebody who has a, a ton more experience than me with dealing with uh, different weather systems and different uh, observations. I think that that is absolutely, I'm not dogging on weather briefers at all. They will tell you straight up. <laughs> there is no guessing with those folks whether or not you should be taking that flight that day. However, this pilot, if we remember, did call flight briefers. And he talked to them and they let him know three times, hey, you can't do it, hey, you can't do it. But, you know, he felt impervious. He felt like, no, I can do it. I've done it. I've done it plenty of times. I've done it in bad conditions before, right? I've been able to make it across. The nice thing about our briefing is that it's not, uh, it's not just somebody telling you, right? Because we, we all have that, that ability to have that anti-authority, some of that imperviousness to be like, yeah, okay, all right, buddy, you said it. I, I, can, I can make it, right? We all have a little bit of that ego. With a briefing, this will show you graphically what's happening, right? This won't just show you, hey, in this area, it starts to get a little bad, might want to go around the mountains. This is showing you right here. There's a convective sigmet in this area, and you need to probably keep that in, in consideration, right? I highly suggest everybody, when you're, when you're planning your routes home or just when you get, get done later, build a flight. Go to uh, the maps page, build a flight in there, then send it over to flights, or just build it in the flights page. Take a look at the briefing. It's really awesome. It, it, it contains all of that information that you would normally get from a flight briefer or that you would normally gather by yourself looking at aviationweather.gov, going to 1-800-WXBrief.com, all of those different things. It's really great information, and uh, it, it breaks it down uh, individually by what are we looking for? We're looking for adverse conditions, we're looking for current weather, looking for METARs along the way, forecast information, winds. So highly suggest taking a look at that uh, because I think it's, I, it's my favorite tool that we have. All right, and this is how we get to it, by the way. I just wanted to show that really quick. Just tap that button, that's it. It'll generate your briefing and you've got a briefing. You don't have to plan anything, uh, well, you do, you do have to plan stuff. Don't, don't let me be on the record saying that. But that's all you've gotta do. Uh, another thing, we do have two formats for the briefing. We have the HTML format where you can choose each one individually and we also have the PDF format. A lot of people wanna share their briefing with their co-pilots, you know, maybe a co-pilot who doesn't have four flight or yet. What you can do is if you change your briefing to the PDF uh, you can then go up to this upper right corner, hit that tile, and then choose to either airdrop it, send it, save it to your four flight documents, or save it to your files flights, where you can then access it later at any given time. All right, so along the route, rail contact was lost due to the relatively low altitude of the aircraft. I think it was at 7,000 feet, but the uh, terrain around him was somewhere around 10,000 feet. So. Uh, two witnesses called and reported the aircraft at extremely low altitudes. One was about 16 nautical miles north of the accident site and claimed that the aircraft was roughly 300 feet AGL with ceilings at 500 feet and the presence of light snow and sleet. Uh, he was flying a debonair, again, just a, just a reminder. Uh, the second located the aircraft roughly four miles north of the crash site, claiming he was at about 100 feet AGL with ceilings less than 500 feet and heavy snow. Ultimately, the pilot collided with the tree while completing a 180 degree, degree turn, presumably to tur turn back, right, due to worsening conditions. He just drove, he just flew right into a funnel, you know. He just kept going until eventually he had nowhere else to go. It's such a shame, you know, that, that this kind of thing happens when we just aren't prepared. 
I want to show you guys really quick. Uh, this isn't weather, but this is the uh, hazard alerts or hazard advisor. Sorry. Uh, this is available with Pro Plus. Pro Plus. Uh, really cool feature. Uh, you can basically, if you see on the right side of the screen there, we have uh, an altitude selector, altitude slider, where you can choose your altitude that you're going to be flying at. And along your route, you, you can see where the terrain is going to be where, and also where uh, any obstacles are going to be. So really helpful if you're into mountain flying, being able to plot your route in a very specific way. Um, I, believe, I believe what happened is, is the pilot in, in question didn't necessarily know how quickly his terrain was going to be coming up. Because he knew about the worsening conditions along his route, he chose a different route to make it through the mountain pass. Unfortunately, he chose the wrong one, one that uh, the terrain came up too quickly and the clouds came down too, also too quickly. I want to touch on one more thing. This is my favorite thing, my favorite little tip and trick, all right? Tip and or trick. So what I have up here right now is the color IR satellite. It's going to be one of your layers. It's going to be on the right side of that menu. If you take a look at the legend here on the bottom, you can see that we have uh, different, different temperatures based upon you know, the, the, uh, the different colors of the IR satellite, right? As we're looking here, we can also see that if we tap on one of the airports within one of these areas, we can tap on the winds aloft area there and we can see the temperature at different altitudes. So, something that we can surmise by looking at both the color IR satellite and looking at and comparing the temperature at the bottom to the temperature on the winds aloft is where the tops of our clouds are. I just think it's neat. I think it's super cool. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Uh, so, yeah, let me um, go up here really quick. So, in the, in the layer selector up here, you'll tap that. Yes, sir. Yeah, you'll hit the color IR satellite. Yeah, and then the, the airport. And I'll, I'll, I can show you some more here a little bit. Yeah, it's just, I, I thought it was kind of a cool, uh, creative way. We were figuring out, doing support one day, how to, how to figure out where the tops are, and uh, it's kind of neat, I thought. Anyways, one more thing I wanted to touch on really quick. Uh, the Sentry. Sentry is our product. It, it's great for keeping that situational awareness while we're flying. Uh, if if y'all made it for Cole's presentation, he talked a lot about having the FISB uh, and TISB information while you're, while you're going uh, in route on your flight. That FISB information will come, uh, come through on the Sentry. It, it, I, I, I use one personally, and it's, it's awesome. You know, you, you get uh, constant updates on your weather. That's, uh, you can get like constant updates to your radar, METARS, TAF, textual weather information. So I definitely recommend uh, at least looking into this product and or other ADSBN type receivers. Uh, some homework I have for everybody. Uh, I know. Uh, the Aviation Weather Handbook has replaced the uh, previous uh, advisory circulars, right? Uh, it used to be 006B, which was aviation weather, and 0054, which was the wind shear. Uh, they basically took all of these advisory circulars, combined it into the we Aviation Weather Handbook. The Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, I don't know if you have ever heard of it. <laughs> uh, chapter 12, Everything Weather. Really great uh, data in there, of course. And then you can always go to the aviationweather.gov forward slash help to find more information on each of, each of the uh, NOAA's weather products. Uh, other ways to learn more, we have our pilot's guide. You can either find it online at our support site, or you can go directly into your uh, ForeFlight app, go to um, the documents page, go down to ForeFlight, and then find the pilot's guide from there. It's going to be extremely helpful figuring out all things ForeFlight. Furthermore, we've got ForeFlight.com backslash videos. This is where you can see uh, a lot of a lot of different seminars, maybe webinars, things that we have, we have put on. If you're new users, we have a monthly getting started with ForeFlight that me, myself, or some of my other uh, colleagues put on. So really great source for information and really great for 
active learning of, of the product it, because it is huge. Um, also, we, al we have the latest info on our blog, blog.forflight.com. It's going to be great for app releases and, and other new information that comes out. And we have a monthly newsletter that you can sign up for. Also, please send, send us an email at team at fourflight.com. This is going to be uh, reaching out to me or my team on the pilot support team. We're always happy to take uh, any questions that you have. And uh, it doesn't just stop at the app. I've answered questions about the legality of 61.129 Alpha 4, which is the solo requirements of of uh, commercial <laughs> aeronautical experience that's way outside of uh, just the app but but it's something that we have fanatical pilot support we're always happy to talk about aviation because we're big plane nerds so please reach out to us we'd love to talk and with that what you got for me any questions yes sir say again oh low tilt uh, how did I know somebody's going to ask Melo? I'm just kidding. Uh, it's a great question, actually. Um, something I want to say first uh, before we get into that is we're all pilots, right? Uh, most of us are either instructors, commercial pilots, something like that. We also love lowest tilt. <laughs> so this is something that we are we are very actively working on 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 the current uh, data source and, and getting that information back, right? Um, I know that sounds like just a talking point, but I can tell you from, from personal experience that, that I know our team is, is, we want the radar, the lowest tilt radar back, because that's what we use, especially as GA pilots and our, a bunch of our rotor friends. So I don't have a timeline for you right now, but it's pretty high on the list of, of what we're working on first. So I just want to let you know that. Yes, sir. Maybe it's whether that gov site is updated in September 12th. Okay. Uh, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I don't I don't have an answer for you right now, but, uh, we do have a lot of our product development team at the booth, so I don't want to tell you anything wrong, but so come on by the booth and, and we'll definitely chat about that. That's, that's interesting. Thanks. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Like the currency of uh, what's 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 the difference of what what you're going to be getting? Um, I believe ADSB does have winds aloft data at the at the airport. The textual. Yeah. So one winds. thing to think about that is how far out are you looking on ADSB? Right. Yes. For some of the weather products, there's a 150 mile range around the lo your location for weather broadcast in there. So you'll see that on radar sometimes where the next red radar will look higher resolution within 150 miles from you, as opposed to further out. So if you're looking at an airport that is within that 150 mile range, you should see winds aloft information from that airport. Uh, but if you're on a longer cross country and you're trying to look at like your destination or a further airport, you may not see some of that update information um, in there. On the website and everything, we pull from the same source that the FAA is using for the FISB broadcast in there. So it should be pretty close. If you are seeing any sort of like connectivity issues where you think, hey, I'm not getting the update that I need to, write into us at Team at Four Flight. We'll work with you to pull diagnostics files and things like that, and we can see if there is something actually going on there, uh, if you notice any kind of weird behavior uh, with how you pick that stuff up. Yeah, these are definitely types of things we like to explore, and we, we want to make sure that our app is as good as possible and, and is, is given the most up-to-date and accurate data as possible. So. If you do come across something that's weird, you know, I had a tendency when I was a student of just kind of blowing it off and being like, well, it'll work when it'll work. But please send, send it in to us because we want to see, we want to see where, where it's, it's faltering, where it's not working so that we can, we can fix it and make it work. But thanks for, the, thanks for the question. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, say it again. Importing and exporting the logbook. Um, yeah, you can do that. Uh, I'm not the logbook expert. We do have somebody at the booth, so I'd recommend t talking to her. Her name's Kendall. She's actually on the logbook team, and that's what she mainly deals with. I believe you have to have a CSV file and it has to be under a certain format. Come, we'll see, be... me. Come see me when we're done here. We'll talk on the import export. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out. I'll be up here for a little bit. If you got any questions, and uh, we'll be happy to talk. We're in the bonus.